it sounds to me that uh, it's sort of external factor, but the way I see it... External to what? Uh, external to uh, what is happening or, or the society. So no, 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 it's part of society. That yeah. It's an integral part of society. It's yeah. external to you, but it's internal to society. Okay, so, so it is internal to society. That means, but then society, what happens in society is determined by uh, uh, many uh, powerful centers uh, uh, who make decisions every day. And uh, don't you think that it's those people who actually uh, somehow uh, try to uh, limit or control what, what we as economists learn, think about, write about, and teach? No, I think what you're doing is looking at this as too much of a short-term thing, thinking, mm -hmm. what are we going to have for ideology today or this week or anything? They, there's, a, there's a tremendous built-in stability of those things, mm -hmm. built-in stability that goes a long ways. For example, uh, the, insofar as there is a fluidity to ideology, it has to do with the capacity of some very powerful centers to frighten us. The ideological fright that led us to believe lies about going to war in Iraq, uh, for example, they had to say, you are at danger. Iraq has nuclear arms and they're going to bomb us and they're going to kill people and their bad things are going to happen, which were all lies. But they had to, that had to be very powerful people and it had to be, and even then there were active, active centers of information going out saying, that's wrong, that's a lie, that's wrong. And it, that was not very effective even then. No effective ideology has built-in structures that are very stable. And very, it's very hard to change the structures of ideology. The, some of the, this critique of welfare economics that I'm talking about in the book, if you look them up, some of them started as long ago as 60 years ago. 60 years ago, some of the trenchant critiques of what's wrong with notions of market efficiency were starting to be developed. And, start, and yet, it's tenacious. It holds on and holds on and holds on. And I don't know of any powerful in individuals who say, I'm going to threaten or I'm going to use my power to do something about. And even, even the College of Business, when they thought I was a communist, couldn't prevent me from being uh, chair. See, there, it, it's, not, it's not that way. It isn't uh, that way. I put the uh, editors in, uh, in the major economic journals. I put their, uh, their job, they're precisely doing this sort of thing because, for example, if I want to submit a paper to a, uh, uh, you know, one of those major uh, job economic journals, I'm sure that uh, they will not even uh, look at my, read my uh, article if I don't make, uh, new, if I don't start with the neoclassical assumptions. So I'm there screening against uh, certain ideas or certain thoughts that may yeah, I don't disagree with this. I don't disagree with this. But see, that has nothing to do with the camouflaging of welfare economics because those journals you're talking about don't defend welfare economics per se if you look in those journals in issue after issue. And if you want to do something in academic journals, there are other academic journals that uh, try to put it out. Uh, well, my, myself, one of my proudest moments, and it's not the AEA or AAR, I mean, or any of those journals, but the Review of Social Economy, I was always a very proud, named an article I wrote as one of the most significant of the 20th century, so I was really happy about that, and I felt really good. It wasn't the AEA, but uh, I don't write stuff to compete in the AEA, and <laughs> so forth. So uh, you can do it, you can do it, but uh, there is a built-in discriminator and if you don't want to deal with the built in <coughs> discriminator then you only have one other option left to you study what they're doing and what they're publishing and try to compete with them that's really 
you do have to accept it. There, this is bigger than any of us. See, what I'd say is if you come to agree with much of what I've said, you've got, because all of us have to eat and pay the rent. We do. And I don't recommend any of you go, go curse or hit someone in the face or throw a bomb or <laughs> do anything like that. If you disagree totally, especially when you're untenured, be polite and be nice and, and, uh, and, and assess, assess what you can do and what you can do and what you can get published and what you can't and do your best because uh, you are basically not dissimilar to Christians in the 14th, 15th, and 16th century who had some doubts about the theology of the, of the Christian church. If, you, if they had some doubts, they didn't go trumpeting it out. Those that did usually died. You know, those who, had, who wanted to get by and have a family and, and have rent and so forth, maybe that trusted people into their family, they said, I don't really agree with this and I don't really agree with that. But that's a part of living in the world. There's two ways you can live in the world. You can agree with all the power elite and all the places there are power and acquiesce in everything and say yes sir and no sir to everyone with power. Or you can find your own compromise somewhere that gives you enough of a sense of uh, pride in, in yourself as a human being, but enough freedom to get by. That's not an easy thing by the way, if you, if you don't agree with the most powerful institutions in society. It's not an easy thing to find exactly where you fit in that compromise. You have to fit. Life is a compromise that way. And it's to say it's a compromise is simplicity, but to actually find where the compromise is for you is horrendously difficult. I like how you put it. <laughs> Because my question originally began in my mind that question of this, um, uh, I mean, how do I uh, liberate myself? Uh, I know there's a world out there uh, that I cannot really influence too much, at least now. And, and, and this world works, on, works based on, uh, say, neoclassical economic ideas. So all the policies, most of the policies that government drives, uh, it's based on uh, neoclassical ideas. And uh, frankly, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not particularly against uh, uh, neoclassical ideas on, uh, you know, religiously, yes. but I still do think that many of those ideas are just simply wrong. So, and to me, uh, to be truly emancipated or to truly uh, 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 liberate myself means not only that I figure out what I think about on my own, what is right and what is wrong and what makes sense and how the society should be, but also it also means that the society is in accordance with what I believe or what I think uh, should be right. Well, society isn't going to be like that. You know, I have to say, since this is an important thing to find your own niche, I have to get that. Now, Kirsten and some other students work hard, and I have a deep appreciation of contacting former students of mine and asking them to put a few paragraphs about their experience working with me as students. And it was very emotional for me to read them all. Some of them were students way back decades ago when I taught in the 1960s and 70s at the University of California, Riverside, and then many of them here at the University of Utah over time. Well, when I started out, I was just like all of you sitting here, you know, I thought, well, and then I started out untenured at the University of California, Riverside, and, and, and I was to the left of most of the people in the department there, and I was careful not to offend anyone and uh, careful to, uh, and uh, you know, none of us sets the world on fire. The world's a huge place. There are billions of people in the world and 
living a life that you can feel good about yourself always involves some compromise. It always, that doesn't mean you compromise too far or you don't feel good about yourself. Doesn't mean you don't compromise at all or you die. So there's some place that's just right. But as I read that book that those students put together, I just started crying because I thought, given everything, and given my life, I made about as big a difference as I could make. I did about as well as I could do. However much it's changed or however little it's changed, I did about as well as I could do. And that's all you can do when you end up. You say, that's about as much as I could do. You know, not too much has changed, but a little bit has changed. There's people like Dick out there teaching at, uh, at oh, oh, over on at uh, 13th East and becoming the and, uh, <laughs> uh, and there are people like my friend Jerry that I was talking about and then, and and all the people uh, almost all the people in that wrote in that book I think about them and they're they're teaching ideas, they're having an impact, and, uh, and if every one of them have an impact similar to what I have, and if every one of you have an impact somewhat similar to I, I, what I had, in another century, who knows what the impact will be? Who knows? I won't be around, and probably none of you will be around, but, but uh, one of my favorite sayings from the 20th century is, uh, when things look really, really bleak, in order to be fully human, it's necessary to have pessimism of the intellect because things look bleak, but optimism of the will. You have to be optimistic. You can do something. You don't have to just be a total lackey and give in to everything. You can have some optimism that you stand up for something. You have some values, and you stand up for something. Yeah. Um, do you then object to the um, social change theories of Marx, Lenin, and alike? Which theories? Tell me. I mean, the revolutionary uh, conclusions of uh, Marx and Lenin, for instance. Which ones? Working class revolution. I mean, should we uh, stay passive um, and try to change, no, little by little, or like reformism? You won't. Or? You won't change anything being passive. I've been. I've spent a lot of being passive. I've had plenty of times where I was scared as hell. I've had times when I've faced police with billy clubs next to me. I haven't talked about them, but I have had those times. So then if everybody... Uh, everybody has to decide. You have to decide. You have to decide where you stand and where you don't stand. And uh, it, uh, it's, things are hard. I had this nice thing where I got to go over to uh, Cairo. I had this nice honor. I was distinguished visiting professor at American University in Cairo. And uh, so I think they got me because I was sympathetic to the Palestinians. They, they liked that. And, uh, they got, and I was talking to them all. And they, and, uh, so when they started their uprising, I was completely sympathetic to the uprising. But I don't know if I'm sympathetic to where the uprising land. I don't know. Things are complex that way. We, we don't know. We don't know where, where we go and what happens. I don't know uh, what's going to happen in uh, Syria. I don't know. That doesn't mean you never do anything. You're, you're in a world right now, and you're in situations where s stuff come up. I have never been in a situation where there's a working class revolution so I can't say what I would do. I have been in a situation where there were black uprisings when I lived in California, and I was on their side. And I faced the police on their side. And I've been in other situations, and uh, so I don't know. Yet. I put, the, put it this way. 
very few of us know on difficult moral dilemmas which side we will be on till the dilemma is there and the danger is there and we think through and we come to that fork in the road and it's really easy in the rocking chair to say I would be on this side or I would be on that side but when we come to the fork in the road and it's there then we can say I was on that side but until that happens uh, and I've never been in that situation so that's never happened to me yet uh, see what I think is there's a romanticism that has developed in the Marxist movements ever since Marx thinking that there was an automaticity to a worker uprising um, I think that's wrong I don't think there's any automaticity to it at all and uh, the the Bolshevik uprising was not a capitalist worker uprising uh, in fact uh, there just isn't in my opinion any evidence to think that there's going to be an automaticity if there ever was such a thing uh, by that time I probably will never come to that fork in the road because I'm too old I mean, I'd wheel my wheelchair up there and say I take this fork <laughs> but uh, I'd be too old who knows uh, but I think that is one of the parts of Marx his analysis of capitalism I think is brilliant his thought that there is an automaticity that workers will rise up and revolt and overthrow the system has proven to be a part of his analysis that just is very hard to believe given the time that's passed since he wrote and in fact I don't believe it. But that's why Lenin didn't take the automatic uh, way but organized the evolution or Mao in that sense. That's right, it, and uh, if uh, and there have always been uh, organizations that organized and overthrew governments that predate Marx and that go on to this time. You can say, for example, some people do say that the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt has an element of a Marxian revolution. I don't think that, but I've heard someone say that. I don't, I don't think that, so who knows? Uh, each situation is complex. That's why it's necessary, in my opinion, not to take anything a priori from what we learned, including anything that I said, <laughs> but <laughs> investigate it. <laughs> yes? So would you think it's important not to think of change in terms of stages, in terms of, because the, there's a tendency in Marxism to uh, think in stages that, okay, if we reach this stage, there'll be an automatic achieving in this stage, if this contradiction is resolved, then, etc., etc., etc. But the problem is that leads into Stalinism and all the problems with that. But if we focus on Marx's early writings, like authentic human development, it gives us that sense of intellect, uh, of, um, you know, optimism of the will, yet pessimism of the intellect. I go a little beyond Marx's early writings, though, because uh, the, his real analysis of capitalism as a coherent system that has certain specifics of functioning uh, is not contained in our, any of his early writings, and that's a very vital, uh, I think that's actually his most brilliant insights, is that anything he wrote about, and uh, there's nothing in that that leads to an automaticity of, uh, uh, I think that whole idea of stages was developed later because nothing was working out. And uh, uh, you, got, you, you got it bastardized in the worst way. Now my mind is slipping. There's some guy around 1960, some conservative. Althusser? Who? Althusser? No, no. Oh well, never mind. See, what happens, there's, there's stages of mental decline, and I'm in, <laughs> I'm in stage one right now, unfortunately. Uh, uh, no, but uh, no, I don't, think, I don't think it does much good to do it in stages, although I do think that we still have 
pretty much a full-blown capitalism that Marx's analysis is still pretty germane to understanding right now, even though it has to be supplemented a lot because things have changed a lot since Marx wrote. It isn't, it isn't sufficient just to read Marx and understand contemporary capitalism, but I think the beginning point of understanding how capitalism is structured begins with Marx, basically better than anyone else. Um, how about the revolution the other way around? That's what's happened in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, I, I, I don't understand socialism, although I grew up in a so-called communist country. Do we understand what socialism really can be, again, on the ground? What, what's your opinion about the revolution in Eastern Europe? There's, that, see, there's a fundamental difference in, in the notion of socialism and capitalism. Capitalism is, is something that uh, is, a, is a set of ideas that evolved to try to describe an actual historical set of circumstances that grew out of uh, his historical evolution that nobody tried to create or nobody, it just came into being. Socialism was a set of ideals of how you would transform capitalism to make it seem like a more just and good society. Uh, so socialism, there is no definition, like there is Marx's definition of capitalism. Since uh, it does seem to me that there are some, given the whole history of socialist ideas, there are some necessary features in order to have any conception of socialism fit into the historical tradition of socialist critiques of capitalism, namely, the means of production have to be controlled socially, not through private property. That seems to me to be a necessary but not sufficient condition. And it does seem to me to be the case that uh, there would not be a complete free market. You could have some markets of some kind but a complete free market does not seem compatible with the history of critiques of capitalism that have been called socialism. But both of those, while I would think of as necessary, are by no means sufficient uh, critiques of socialism. And the reason it's so hard to come up with a uh, view of socialism that would unite everyone is that one of the worst features of capitalism is the individualistic alienation of uh, pitting every person against every other and the vision of a more socially oriented society where people take care of each other. Now, I don't know of any communist country that's gone any distance in pursuing that goal, but the 19th century socialists were very serious about that and wanted that. And whether, the, whether or not See, that, that's the difficulty we have of socialism. People say, are you a socialist? And the only reason I say yes is because I feel a solidarity with that tradition of people who criticize capitalism from those points of view. It isn't, there isn't one of them that I would say I agree with every single point of view they have, because it, it, there isn't any solid, substantial, Thing there, it's just a set of criticisms. But taking care of each other uh, makes you humanitarian, and and that's what has was missing, uh, you know, it, it makes you a humanitarian. But you see, what is required to be a humanitarian? Many people believe that you can that you can have humanitarian capitalism. The socialist tradition says you cannot. That's the key thing. That's the key thing in the socialist tradition. It says the very institutional basis of capitalism leads to results that are not only non-humanitarian, but in many ways anti-humanitarian. Hmm. Yes. Uh, my, my question is about the... Uh, about the history of economic thought. 
but uh, do you think uh, it is a, what do you think it is a function of, in other words, what do you think uh, are the forces that uh, affect or determine the dynamics of uh, uh, the changes in, uh, in, the, in the economic thoughts over time? Um, and, and do you think that, uh, and in what sense do you think we can uh, control or contribute to those forces that affect the dynamics of uh, economic thoughts over time? That seems like a bigger issue than I ever think about it. Oh. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> the, the, all I can say is that you, you think about it yourself. I mean, I was, I didn't set out initially to write this huge book. Uh, I set out initially to clarify a lot of things for myself, and I loved looking at intellectual history and loved writing about it and eventually decided to uh, take things I've done and, and work in the direction of doing this book, but I don't know any forces that affect changes in in that. I, I don't I just individuals think about it and write about it. And, uh, and, uh, uh, I, I don't uh, the one thing I one thing I don't have, one thing I'm very skeptical about is uh, any mechanistic theories that explain ideas. I don't think ideas flow mechanistically from anything. We study and we think about it and we talk and uh, I talk to all of you. You talk to people. You read things. I read things. Uh, we. Uh, I grew up a good Mormon boy. There are many Mormon ideas that I learned as a little boy that have profoundly affected my thinking to this day, but others that I've discarded long ago, and uh, ideas that I learned when I was a student of philosophy that have affected my thinking to this day, others I've discarded, ideas that I learned in economics that have affected me. And, and that's true, I think, of every one of you. As you go through life, you encounter so many ideas, and you think about them a lot and you work them over in your minds and some of them just don't feel quite right to you and you uh, maybe slough them off and others bother you. The, here's what I think. If an idea, and this gets to that quotation from Marx on the front cover that I got, if an idea bothers you, if it really bothers you and you have to think about it a lot and you read about it a lot, and it really bothers you, chances are it'll be a quite important idea by the time you work it through and really think about it and work it through and come to conclusions that uh, really satisfy you. That'll be an important idea in your life. 